Welcome back. I'm glad you're watching Morning Express. Time now for The Way It Is. And uh, for this conversation, we're joined by lawyer William Oketch, who was here for a newspaper review segment. Thank you for staying with us, William. And we also have uh, Jack, Jack Turnobura, who is uh, the MP aspirant to Isambo County. We'll also be joined uh, later on by Mombasa Senator Omar Hassan. And our conversation this morning focuses on uh, the bid for AU Commission uh, Chairperson Foreign Affairs, uh, CS Amina Mohammed, among the five candidates who are battling it out for that position whether she will clinch the position will be known by the end of the day we will also be focusing on that uh, dawn attack on friday on acadia forces in somalia al-shabaab claims to have killed about 57 kenyan soldiers but the kenyan government claims the number was much less than that we'll be focusing on that as well gentlemen many thanks for joining us and uh, let's begin with you jackton a lot of uh, pomp now of uh, amina <laughs> mohammed's uh, candidature at the AU uh, Commission Chairperson. Do you think she stands a chance of being uh, the next uh, chairperson? Yeah. yeah, personally, I think she stands a chance, mm -hmm. bearing in mind um, she was one of the very active CS we had, you know, and just going around and, you know, just putting Kenya on the map. Mm -hmm. So to me, I think she's done well, and um, I'll prefer if she gets that chance because at the same time, now Kenyans will be on the map again mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. So I'm very positive and let's see how people will vote. Right. Yeah. right. And that is a question we're asking you this morning on our question of the day. Do you think CS Amina Mohammed stands the chance of clinching the AU, AU Commission chairperson? Do you think CS Amina Mohammed stands the chance of being the next AU chairperson? Do talk to us on Twitter at KTN News, at KTN Kenya, at Michelle Ngele. Uh, that is a question. Do you think CS Amina Mohammed has a chance of being the next AU chairperson. You can also use hashtag Morning Express KTN. All right, and uh, William, of course, among the bigger discussions is uh, some of the factors that will influence this election. Among them, of course, is the candidate's experience, but also the ability to solve emerging problems in the continent. You know, we're talking about dr uh, drought, insecurity, uh, a failing economy. Do you think CS Amina Mohammed has exuded enough... Uh, you know, confidence in, in tackling these particular matters? Uh, CS Ambassador Amina Mohammed has all the needed credentials. Mm -hmm. uh, talk of her education, um, talk of her experience. Uh, she's served in very high levels in, in, in those diplomatic cycles. Uh, but this election really is going to be hinged on uh, several uh, geopolitical factors. One, for a very long time, you find that uh, West Africa and South Africa, they've, they had dominated the geopolitics of the African Union, mm -hmm. previously the OAU. Uh, increasingly, after coming in of the Jubilee administration, you found that uh, Uhuru Kenyatta had aggressively uh, marketed Kenya. He played a, a critical role, especially at the backdrop of the ICC cases. Uhuru Kenyatta came out strongly and uh, he was one of the African heads of station which was calling out for the withdrawal of Africans from the Rome Statute. Mm -hmm. um, but really when you look at, because the elections will be pegged on some of the regional blocks. You have ECOWAS for West Africa, you have SADAC for Southern Africa, the East African. Um, the strongest competitor to Ambassador Mohammed will be ECOWAS mm -hmm. candidate, mm -hmm. uh, who is the candidate for Senegal. ECOWAS has proven its mettle. We just saw recently with the incident in the Gambia, uh, where the ECOWAS troops and the heads of state, they were very firm. Yaya Jame had lost the election. He had to go. Mm -hmm. They put their feet down, and he went. That will be a plus for that candidate. Right. However, uh, our solace is that within West African ECOWAS states, we have Anglophone and Francophone countries. Mm -hmm. There seems to be a split. The West African uh, Anglophone countries seem to be supporting Kenya. Talk of Nigeria. Uh, talk of Cameroon, they seem to be supporting Kenya. Mm -hmm. That is our solace. If Ambassador Mohammed is able to go through the first round, uh, then our hopes are that she'll ultimately come out as the consensus candidate. Mm -hmm. She pushed very strongly the issue of the ICC. That one could be a favor with those countries which uh, have backed that call for Africans to get out of that Rome mm -hmm. statute. Mm -hmm. So she does stand a good chance. All right, and I like that you bring in the ICC factor, Jackson. Yeah. This is something that has uh, spearheaded Amina Mohammed's bid for the AU uh, chairperson uh, position. But uh, 
A lot of critics say the reason why Kenya has really pushed this position is because of the ripple effect of the now collapsed ICC cases. As we speak, the International Criminal Court is quietly uh, getting more evidence on uh, allegations of witness tampering during the ICC cases against Uhuru and Ruto. I mean, do you think that could be a reason why she's being pushed so high? <laughs> you know, at, uh, it can be political mm -hmm. as, as, as we look at it, but then again, uh, I also think her being uh, there as our CS for foreign affairs and the kind of work she has done as the ambassador, bearing in mind the issues of ICC, because as far as I'm concerned, the issue of ICC is a past tense to, to, to the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we want is that uh, we want her to go there and represent the, the whole Africa. As much as there is much politics that is being played down and, you know, me and everybody knows what ICC is doing behind the scene. I, I don't think that must, can be a very good reason for them to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but um, personally, I think uh, she's done a good job. She's been there. And uh, if she gets that position, then I think uh, Kenya will be happy. Right. I mean, yeah. let's get William's uh, thoughts. Yes, Do you yes. think ICC <laughs> is past tense, as he says? No, not necessarily so. The issue of ICC is still an issue on the table. Mm -hmm. uh, you are aware that there is a, a majority of uh, Kenyans, uh, talk of uh, the civil society movements, um, talk of those who uh, really firm about the rule of law. Mm -hmm. They're worried that should you take Kenya out of the ICC, then where will be the mechanisms for accountability? Right. Mm. Especially that now the preferred African Union uh, court, that is the African court, they have made it, the heads of states have made it very clear that one of the objectives will be to ensure that serving African heads of state are granted immunity mm -hmm. against prosecution so long as they are serving, despite any other crimes that they may have committed. That will be very worrying. Because you'll find yourself, now where will be the accountability mechanisms for those people who come under the wrath of dictatorial regimes? Mm -hmm. So I think ICC in Kenya, it's still not a done issue. There's still debate mm -hmm. going forward. But despite, and I said it, despite our local politics and our local differences, we ought not to begrudge the ambassador this chance. It will be a plus for Kenya. Let us support us. The ICC issue, when it comes up, parliament will debate it and all stakeholders will have a say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. And I mean, uh, Jackton, uh, William also brought in the issue that uh, mm -hmm. she could gain more favor with regard to the ICC because there's now the threat of a mass walkout from the ICC. Uh, you know, is that something that is likely to give her more, you know, a boost in this election? Yeah, I, I, I think that one can, uh, can give her a boost because, you know, when, um, as a Kenyan country, what, what, what was happening is that uh, we wanted to pull out of the Rome Statute. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, there was a lot of mobilization and, you know, guys were being told most African countries, this is the way we should do it. And this is a way to go. But as my colleague just said here earlier, as much as personally, I think uh, as a country, the, you know, the, 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 the president and the deputy were cleared from all this. But still, if you look at Africa uh, at large, there are still some leaders who are dictatorial and um, some of them also think that uh, it's not a good idea to pull out. Some of them also think that uh, there are people who still are going to suffer when, when this kind of thing happens. But bearing in mind the kind of uh, activities that took place during that time, I think she stands a chance right. because most of them are supporting that. All right. All right, and allow me now to introduce uh, Mombasa Senator Omar Hassan. Many thanks for joining us uh, in studio this morning. A lot has been said about Amina Mohammed's candidature at uh, the AU and uh, about her credibility as well. But, uh, you know, in your view, does she have the capability of clinching this position? Uh, you know, the, the only reason I'm supporting Amina Mohammed is one, because she's a Kenyan, mm -hmm. and secondly, because I don't know the other candidates. Their right. profile in terms of. Uh, um, their standpoints on various issues. But I mean, uh, if Kenya is going there because it wants to uh, uh, present a, a, a front of impunity, a front of, uh, you know, uh, anti ICC, I mean, how many African countries today, apart from Botswana, essentially are full of African leaders when it comes to human rights standards? So uh, the AU cannot bask itself with the glories of the yesteryears of uh, policies of non interference, policies of, uh, you know, uh, not, not being a peer. Uh, appear enough mm -hmm. in the, let's say, to, your, to other countries. Kenya today should have been a country that exports values. Kenya should have been a country that exports democracy. Kenya should have been a country that 
is a beacon for others to emulate. We don't want to go there to be to, to start, uh, you know, aggressive politics of uh, of ICC and uh, you know uh, and you know. But I, as, as uh, and all these other uh, excesses that have painted Africa in bad light, mm -hmm. are we able to tell leaders on, like Yaya Jame once you have lost an election to, to move out and things of that nature? So. Um, she has my favor just because I do not, don't know the rest of the people and because she's a Kenyan. Uh, but I, if there was a p person I was told, let's say, of sound human rights credentials, a person of a certain greed and a certain attitude and a certain capacity and a certain uh, you know, transformative agenda of the AU, to now make the AU a more robust movement, a more robust organization, imbibe the Pan-African agenda, imbibe the Pan-African agenda on social economic rights and uh, to ensure that Africans uh, you know, uh, grow their economies and fight corruption mm -hmm. and imbibe democracy to make our people better off than what they were, uh, with what they are. Yeah, I think that would have been a, a, a progressive mind. We are having a, uh, you know, even redefinition of the AU charter and our relationships as states. But everybody else just wants it for prestige, you know, of the prestige of a country. What is the Kenya's agenda for the right. AU? So you do not think she is qualified for this job? Because I believe on qualified the standard this is. morning, there's a, a whole page on her credentials yeah. and, you know, her working with the UN, her being foreign affairs minister. Qualified she is. Mm -hmm. uh, qualified she is. She's worked with the, she was our ambassador in Geneva. She then uh, was... Um, uh, Permanent Secretary, Ministry of Justice. Then she became, uh, she worked with the United Nations and then she came in here. Qualification do you do have? Everybody. It's like when you say you need 10 years to become a judge Experience, or something right. like that. Mm -hmm. She does have the minimum qualification. Mm -hmm. She does have. But whether she's, she, she has the, she has the, uh, the, out, the, the capacity or the, the, not capacity, but the, the, the greed, the courage to tell Africa that you're wrong now. We need to move forward uh, an agenda that is more progressive. Look look at our countries, look at our nations. They're all, they're all dilapidated in terms of poverty. Mm -hmm. Look at what is happening. You look at the corruption, look at the you know, reversal of democratic gains. So this is what our Africa needs to imbibe. Forget these uh, niceties of, uh, you know, in, uh, you know in, tw in the 20th century, 21st century, you're fighting, uh, you're still trying to, have to, to, to institutionalize impunity. I think these are some of the issues, human values, universal rights, mm -hmm. you know, uh, social justice. Right. That's what Africa needs to do, redefine right. itself. All right, and very credible issues that are being brought up. William, I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Uh, yeah, just like Senator said, uh, despite our own ideological differences, mm -hmm. uh, she is Kenyan, uh, she is the face of this country. Mm -hmm. uh, AU, the chair of the AU Commission is a very critical role in terms of policy initiatives in terms of uh, bringing out the issues that matter. And I, I, I think I would like to loud the call that Ambassador Amina should not, should she win, then her core agenda should not be to take her Kenya out of the ICC. Mm -hmm. It should be to tackle the issues that are currently bedviling the continent, talk of uh, poverty, talk of uh, misrules, um, talk of the issue of um, even the women agenda and youth. Those are issues that she should tackle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. and you know the uh, country, Michelle, that has been quite on the right side on, on, on many of these arguments in the context of Africa, mm -hmm. I'll be very honest, is Botswana. Botswana has uh, demonstrated itself as a country that is able to live strongly within the chart of the AU. Mm -hmm. First country to, 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 to not to recognize Ahia Jam immediately uh, his tenure ended, it, it spoke about that it was the only country that had assertively said it was not withdrawing from the ICC. It is the only country that talks about certain travesties of African leaders across the, world, across the continent. And I think that's what Africa needs. This, this commentary, this comradeship of, 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 of impunity, this, uh, you know, uh, uh, coalition of crime and coalition of, uh, you know, uh, impunity should, should, should stop. Uh, that's what Africa is about. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what African Union is about. All right, uh, let's have yeah, a final idea uh, before we move Interestingly, to uh, Senator is quite right to find that Botswana has a candidate. Mm -hmm. But then uh, pundits have uh, rightly said that uh, the candidature of the Botswana uh, former foreign affairs minister is going to be hurt mm -hmm. by the stance, tough stance that was taken by the President Ian Kama. Uh, he and Kama actually removed himself from AU meetings. Uh, the last he attended was about two or three years ago. Uh, he's been very critical of some of the AU stances, and that will certainly hurt the candidature of that 
person from mm -hmm. yeah right. Botswana. And uh, Jackson, before we come to you, Ali, you'd mentioned something rather interesting uh, because the ICC issue seems to be coming up a lot with uh, Amina Mohammed's candidature. On the front page of the Star today is a story about the ICC reviving uh, its uh, case on uh, allegations of witness tampering with regard to the ICC. And uh, Senator uh, Omar. Jackson seems to think the ICC is a done and deal issue. It's in the past now. Do you agree with that? What do you mean? What, That's what, what he said. No, what, he says ICC is no longer an issue. No, no, no. no. <laughs> what, what I was saying in, in terms of, you know, when, when we are talking of uh, Ambassador Amina's candidate, mm -hmm. and then we bring the issue of ICC, to me, I think as a country, of course, there are some issues that are still there. There are some, you know, we still have IDPs. Mm -hmm. We still know very well that there are some. Um, uh, tampering of witness and uh, you know that that is something that is still in progress but when it comes to the issue of Amina's candidature I, I, I don't think the issue of ICC should arise mm -hmm. you yeah. know whether whether Kenya's withdraws from the ICC or not it does not affect the cases before it currently that is Kenya it's called Kenya one and Kenya two the, uh, that is the one Kenya one is the, the case when William Ruto Kenya two is out of Uru Kenyatta and uh, the cases were not withdrawn people think that those cases were like you know, there was a Nola prosecutor or something. They were not. They were just. They were just. They were just put aside. Mm -hmm. they, they are dormant. In the event that there is, based on those all those considerations, like lack of cooperation by Kenyan state, uh, uh, withdrawal of critical witnesses from from the case. In fact, an unprecedented withdrawal um, of of critical of witnesses in a, in any situation that has been prosecuted by any international mechanism was the Kenyan situation. Mm -hmm. Disappearances and intimidation of witnesses, uh, among other, many other things. So, in the event. Uh, witness so and so decide they, they want to restate the evidence and certain new information comes before the ICC. Those matters could proceed, not even in the next five years or so, mm -hmm. unless the, the, the trial chamber uh, now decides to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, you know, totally uh, make a ruling that says that the cases are, to that extent, withdrawn. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in, the, in, the, in the meantime, if you read the ruling of the trial chamber, it was just about they were set aside briefly. Mm -hmm. on the basis that there was not enough evidence. That was the application by the prosecutor. Uh, the, 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 the witness tampering, the unprecedented withdrawal of witnesses, um, the, 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 the lack of cooperation by the Kenyan state, plus other mitigating issues that, asked, that, uh, that uh, necessitated uh, the, the, the prosecutor uh, to ask that the matters be stayed. Mm -hmm. All right, and I uh, will be keeping an eye on how that works out. But uh, let's move away from this because we'll be watching the situation with the elections. But uh, on Friday, Kenyans woke up to news that uh, KDF soldiers in Somalia had been attacked in another dawn raid by Al Shabaab militants. And uh, initially, Al Shabaab said it had killed 57 Kenyan soldiers, uh, something that uh, the Kenyan army denied. And uh, there's a lot of controversy surrounding this as to whether that was the actual number, whether the number was nine, as was said by the Kenyan army. But let's begin with you, Senator Omar. Uh, your thoughts, first of all, on this uh, very horrendous death of our soldiers. First of all, my utmost condolences to the families and uh, to the victims of, um, for, for, for whatever happened. Um, I think uh, I, I share in the, in the point of view that Kenya must be bringing its, uh, its engagement in Somalia to a sunset. There must be a phased withdrawal, and let's safeguard our territorial borders. Oh, let's 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 retreat into our territories, um, and and allow some of these positions to be taken up by the Somali National Army, because what the only solution to Somalia rests with the Somali people themselves. And I think the best thing is to to, to equip and capacitate the Somali National Army to secure the integrity of of uh, the Somali state. So for for us, I think a, a protracted uh, uh, engagement that has no timetable. Uh, of, of withdrawal is, 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 is detrimental. Right? We, we need to stabilize Somalia and we need to get out as soon as we can. So when we say withdrawal from Somalia, we don't mean you pick up your, your tools like what we did in South Sudan and just start flying the soldiers mm -hmm. back. I mean, you, you have a phased withdrawal that the, 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 the positions you occupy at this point in time are then taken over by the Somali National Army. So you train and tool the Somali National Army to be able to, to take up uh, the positions that uh, uh, they say the army some troops or any other troops will dis will, 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 will disengage from. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The seven, number two is uh, someone tell the standard they did the right thing, you know, to report accurately. Mm -hmm. Because every international media is say, telling us that they, that's in excess of 60. This Kenyan, uh, uh, you know, perception that a, when you hide facts is when you are doing the country service is lack of patriotism. Mm -hmm. We have the right to know. Ameri when Americans, uh, American forces are blown up by the e 
uh, improvised like, uh, uh, explosive devices, they tell the public. You cannot tell us that uh, we don't know how many people lost, were lost in the last, in, in Elad, when yet we know that about 100 plus Kenyans did mm -hmm. not return home. Let's stop this, uh, this crap of uh, thinking that you only express your, your, your patriotism. In fact, the freedom of information, that right to know, that, 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 that headline by the standard was appropriate. Mm -hmm. We need to know what is going on so that Kenyans can, be, can make accurate decisions. This, uh, this, uh, this uh, pseudo uh, patriotism that you hide facts and conceal figures and uh, you know, uh, that you, uh, you, you publish a denial of the, of the KDF alongside uh, a figure that the entire international media has confirmed mm -hmm. or is, is carrying. So what is this, 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 this thing about Kenyans thinking patriotism means you do not report uh, accurately? Right. So I think, uh, this, um, the, I think that they did the right thing. And I, as I said, that the court position is to evaluate our engagement in Somalia. Mm -hmm. Jackson, do you agree with Senator Omar on with regard to the withdrawal of troops from Somalia? Oh, uh, personally, uh, I think first my condolences to the family, but uh, there must be an exit you know, strategy. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, this is my personal view that uh, this should have happened a long time ago. Uh, as you know, uh, our soldiers are dying every now and then. Mm -hmm. There's no proper reporting. As you know, most of the information are being hidden from us. But the families are suffering. If you look at the families who've lost their, their, you know, their breadwinners, there are so many. But any time uh, the media reports, the number is less than what we know and everybody knows. So. Uh, I will agree with the senator that uh, we must have an exit strategy, but that doesn't mean that we just come out immediately, you know, uh, because there's a capacity. We've done our best in Somali. Mm -hmm. It's high time now we bring back our people right. so that uh, at least Somali can now be by themselves so that they can take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's very sad when after six months, three months, uh, our brothers are, are dying and uh, without trace. Some have even not been traced from, you know, and they're family don't know. Mm -hmm. But this is something that uh, is being played quietly. I, I don't know the reason as to why. And, you know, three, four months down the line, some families will come up. We've never been compensated. We've never seen our kin. So I, I think it's just unfortunate what is happening I, 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 in, in, in the country. We must get the right information. We must know what is happening. And I'll also agree that uh, with time, we should bring back our men, uh, our soldiers. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I mean, William, when we were speaking earlier, we were speculating on th this lack of transparency over this entire issue and the number of soldiers that indeed died. Mm -hmm. And the question was whether this is a ploy to cover up uh, cases of mismanagement uh, by the top management. Because like we mentioned, this attack happened in exactly the same way like the Elade attack. And the questions, I mean, lessons seem not to have been learned. Oh, yes, quite right. I think we, we need to draw parallels. Uh, you have Burundian forces in Somalia. You have Ugandan forces in Somalia. Mm -hmm. uh, sometime back, an incident had happened where uh, the Ugandan uh, base in Somalia had been attacked. And for a very long time, there had been low soldier morale uh, due to some inefficiencies of the seniors. Mm -hmm. Talk of uh, squandering of funds, uh, selling of supplies. The Ugandan military establishment reacted very differently. Mm -hmm. All those commanders were dismissed. There were some are really called back home. And all of them were subjected to uh, military trials, court martials. Mm -hmm. And they had to be accountable for what they did. And new people were deployed in Kenya. That has not been the case. In Kenya, we seem to operate on this mode of hush-hush. When something goes wrong, no one takes the blame, no one is accountable. Mm -hmm. Kenya suffers greater than even these other nations which have forces there. The ideals of Operation Lead and Inchi were very fine at the initial stages. Uh, we were to get in there, dismantle the Al-Shabaab's operational efficiencies, and then thereafter create a buffer zone between them and us. Uh, uh, especially with regards to the Juba land. But then you find that uh, when you get in a war and it gets protracted, then you fall at the risk of turning uh, into an occupier, the view into an occupier. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing which happened to, to the US in Iraq. And then uh, when the moment you start engaging Al-Shabaab in guerrilla tactics, Kenyan army may be well trained, good, but they may not be so well in guerrilla tactics. And that's where now you find that uh, you start losing the initial objectives. It has been said, uh, some certain confidential documents have said that uh, conflict in itself is an industry mm -hmm. in Somalia. Mm -hmm. There are warlords who reap millions of shillings, uh, sale of charcoal, smuggling, 
uh, contraband goods. And even uh, quite sad, so uh, there have been some information which has even linked Kenyan uh, soldiers in this illegal sale mm -hmm. of charcoal. So I think it is high time, as uh, Senator said, as my brother said, we need a reevaluation. Have we lost objectives of what took us there? Mm -hmm. And if we are not getting anywhere near those objectives, it's time to do a first withdrawal. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, when, you, when, uh, when, any, when any army or any foreign force overstay their welcome in any country, they mutate into an occupation right. force. Mm -hmm. What will happen then is, uh, because there are various violations of human rights by the Kenyan military, it's, it's reported in various reports of the UN. Mm -hmm. you, cannot, you cannot agree with some reports and uh, deny, deny others. International bodies have reported on these issues. Uh, 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 bombing of innocent uh, civilians, um, uh, allegations of rape, and other allegations of the Kenyan soldiers. So when these, 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 these allegations continue to, to cement, they start to create a nationalist sentiment. And that's why, in fact, Al-Shabaab was born out of a nationalist sentiment to mm -hmm. drive out, that is the Union of Islamic Court, to drive out um, uh, Ethiopia. Because Ethiopia ultimately was looked at as an occupation force when it came to restore uh, President um, uh, Ahmed, uh, President Abdullahi. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the issues that we need to, know, to, 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 to soundly debate and interrogate whether our protracted stay in Somalia. And then my only other thing is just my analogy, strategic analogy about uh, the bases we are creating. It appears we are creating small little bases, 120 soldiers, mm -hmm. 200 soldiers. Now Al-Shabaab, when they come in, in, a, in droves of 200, 300, they will overwhelm you. Right. And those are, those are not the normal soldiers. They call themselves holy warriors. Mm -hmm. They've come for two reasons, either to ex exterminate you or to, 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 to die. Right. They're, not, they're not you who wants to go back to your family mm -hmm. in, uh, in um, in uh, uh, Nyali Bay, uh, well, Nyali, Mombasa, or wherever else. So, so these are some of the, th the, the, the issues that we need to look at. When you're fighting a war that is also based on an ideology of belief, you have to disarm that ideology mm -hmm. of belief, yeah, well, no, so that you can be able to now uh, in, engage in a more conventional sense. So I think in my assessment, they, they, there's need for a little bit of thing. Uh, in fact, of the overall strategy of, of, on Somalia mm -hmm. by the international community and our continued Amazon stay in Somalia, or including the Kenyan forces, and what contingents do we need to build? You know, when you hear uh, the, the U.S. or other big countries is in the country, the base is something like our old village. It's like a new town coming up. Mm -hmm. There's uh, air support. There's, uh, mm -hmm. there's literally a town building around it. Uh, you hear of the, the, the fortification of these bases is an, an enormous thing. I think here, yeah, I don't know how we fortify it, but, but it looks to me like uh, if you get this run over, it's probably just uh, the barbed wires and a couple of other you know, uh, things. So we need, we need if we are to, you, 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 so you put people at, at harm's way when you know that uh, when Al Shabaab puts in through 300 militia, they can easily overrun you mm -hmm. and uh, probably uh, outweigh you in terms of the balance of firepower. All right. right. And I'd still like to get your thoughts, Senator Omar, on the overall war against terror and the gains that have been made in the country. Just the other day, there was a letter circulating on social media, purportedly from the Kenya National Police Service, uh, a warning of an impending attack by Al Shabaab officials. Now, the Kenya Police Service came out and said that letter was not credible and was not uh, from the Kenya Police. But there's been a lot of allegations, uh, especially in the coastal region in this war against terror, that innocent civilians are being killed, uh, there's a lot of extrajudicial killings and uh, no explanation, all in the war of a fight against terror. I think any, 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 any engagements, any interventions by Kenya must be based, by our country, must be based on, on the constitutional standards. Mm -hmm. You do not fight terror with terror. You do not, just because this is, this is a criminal gang, do you not now officialize crime. Once these guys are killing, you don't start killing. Your, your values, your constitutional doctrine is much higher. Mm -hmm. That's how countries behave, and that's how you disarm even the ideology of terror. When you, the, the, the terror is not just uh, 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 an action. It's not an act. It's, a, it's an ideology. It, 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 it manifests itself with what people call violent extremism. Mm -hmm. you, know, you start with extremist ideas, you, and you graduate it uh, you know, gradually and deliberately to the point where you now engage people with respect to violence. So when you want to disarm that, you have to disarm it from the very, from the very root. So what happens, what's the narrative of terror? Uh, it's about victimization, it's about humiliation, it's about you know, rights of Muslims, it's about you guys not doing enough for us, you know, you've marginalized us. 
and the more you apply uh, strategies that, are, that, that tend towards uh, um, uh, uh, violations of the Constitution, mm -hmm. it actually is the fodder. It waters that, that, that ideology or that narrative, and it becomes so, uh, it becomes a dominant narrative. So the counter-narrative, you know, including the, the occupation or the, the the, our intervention in Somalia, you know, one of the, if you look at it, is about a liberation of holy lands and Muslim lands that have been occupied by infidels, you know, be it in Syria, be it in, uh, in, uh, in Palestine, be it in uh, Iraq, be it in Afghanistan, be it in Somalia. It's one of the fronts that is looked at in the global war on terror. Mm -hmm. So okay, Kenya becomes a very potent enemy when it comes to, 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 to the networks of terror. So based on that, we, mu we must disarm all those uh, uh, elements. That's why Obama tried to withdraw the, the, the troops from Afghanistan, from Iraq, mm -hmm. so that you disarm that, that narrative. So we need to constantly uh, disarm these narratives by, by appearing that we, we attack the very foundations of it. Right, all right. And uh, gentlemen, let's move away from this discussion now and focus on another story that's uh, developing in the country, and that is 57 days now since uh, doctors went on strike. Uh, there seems to be no end in sight just yet. And now uh, the doctors' union is uh, claiming that uh, private cartels are untwisting the government in these negotiations in a bid to ensure that uh, they do not lose their profits uh, you know, in different parts of the country. Jackton, let's begin with you. Uh, this is a new twist now in this statement. 57 days later, Kenyans are still dying. Which way out? Uh, I, I, I think uh, as a country we should come up clear on uh, this issue of uh, you know, doctors because you'll find that uh, I also lost, in, 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 in the last one month, I've lost two or three of my close relatives mm -hmm. just because of these doctors' mm -hmm. issues. And um, as somebody who come from, you know, like my area, I, I personally think that it's really even affecting the poor people more than, you know, these other people, uh, the rich, because now mm -hmm. then some can go, some have private doctors. To others, their life will continue, mm -hmm. but there are so many people who are suffering. So I, I, I think uh, this is something that we should not even be discussing. It's something that even the doctors should already have agreed with the government on, you know, the way forward for them now to come back and work because if, if you use threats and intimidation uh, like uh, you know telling them we are going to suck or we are going to bring other doctors that one will not solve the problem mm -hmm. you know uh, the court cases and you know they are being threatened you will be jailed and everything I, I, I think it's just unfortunate as a country and in this era that we still uh, uh, threaten people we still have this mechanism of you know uh, we, we, we just don't want to face uh, the reality, what is happening on the ground. Uh, I, I think the minister, the ministries that are in charge, they should have already settled out this and, you know, sit down. And it's true, it might be true that, you know, there are some hidden forces that are, are playing it down because I, I still wonder 60 days and nothing still has come up mm -hmm, on the table. Mm -hmm. And it's we will yeah. be talking to Senator Omar to tell us whether these private cartels are being seen or felt in the coastal <laughs> region. But William, I mean... Yeah. The exact, the bringing the cartels in is a big deal now because it, you know, it revolutionizes this entire story. What are your thoughts on this? Oh yes, uh, during a spat between uh, uh, former president Mwalimu Nyerere and Jomo Kenyatta, Kenyatta had then referred to Tanzania as a man-eat-nothing society. Mm -hmm. In return, Nyerere referred to Kenya as a man-eat-man society. Uh, meaning it was then a deeply capitalistic country mm -hmm. where you find that owners of capital, uh, once they bring in their capital, then they would expect uh, that their overriding objective was to accumulate as much profit as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been in existence for a very long time uh, uh, very strong lobbies in the name of private interests who are keen to influence certain areas of public policy. Uh, being that in, in Kenya, the area of lobbying has not been regulated unlike the US. It's, there's normally a very thin line between uh, genuine lobbying and uh, ulterior corrupt practices. Mm -hmm. I referred you to the example when uh, the then Minister of Health, Charity Ngil, was trying to bring in the universal health care cover. Uh, the private insurance sector players at that time really came out strongly to oppose this move, mm -hmm. realizing that should Kenyans, the local Wanjiku, middle class, should they get this universal cover, then it will substantially have eaten away into their profit base. Mm -hmm. So they had every reason to fight it. So likewise, the claim by the medical uh, union that uh, the private sector has an hand in scuttling any outcome, it does have credence. 
Because when you find that when uh, doctors in the public sector have been paid and their terms have been in, uh, improved substantially, a lot there will be a, like a brain migration. A lot will move from the private sector to the government uh -huh, sector. Uh -huh. And that will eat down in the profits which uh -huh. are there in, in the private, private sector. sector. So it is a genuine concern. But at the end of the day, I think the national interest is very important. Uh, all players need to give and take, spirit of give and take, so that this issue is resolved once and for all. Right, right. Yeah. And the Senator, uh, talking of these private mm -hmm. cartels, is this a thing that is being uh, witnessed in the coast region? Uh, I mean, I, I can't point any finger to it in particular terms, mm -hmm. but I, it, there's definitely some uh, currency that goes behind these types of things. That you secure a, a, a first-class medical uh, service, public, public, uh, public service, then uh, public health, then it means ostensibly you kill private uh, private sector and if you look at it that uh, it's a uh, the public health care is a massive cartel mm -hmm. uh, massive cartel in the sense that you spend a day or two in ICU in certain hospitals you take it it, 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 it raids your bank account to three million shillings right. you 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 go there and you spend a day or two your entire insurance is, is, is exhausted Every other small element they want to admit you. Every other small element they want to do, mm -hmm. to, you know, everybody this day is delivering through C-section. So you will start to wonder maybe these narratives, are they true or they're not true? And I, and I think it's important that we, we create a first-class uh, healthcare service because it's, it's our element. You see, it depends on the philosophy of the country. Mm -hmm. If I today was to govern this country, I would pay three sectors very well. Health, security, and education. Mm -hmm. Teachers will be the highest paid professionals. You will want to be, leave and KTN yet, to become uh, a teacher. <laughs> I'm telling you, you will, everybody will want to become a teacher. Industrial action over the past two years. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. you, want to, you want to become a teacher in this country. You want to become a police officer mm -hmm. in this country. And you want to become a doctor. Because, I mean, as it sounds, I don't even think any kid wants to become a doctor anymore, uh, seeing what <laughs> doctors are going through and right you know, now. They're, they're only 3,500, a country that cannot deal, a council of governors that is inept, that's, that's returning us to the outer chaos. Of, of, of the Nyayo regime. You see, if you look at the structure of how every governor carries himself out, mm -hmm. they just be, they're just like any colonial lord or the, colo the, 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 the one party rule, uh, you know, provincial commissioner. All they care about is their, is their motorcade and their, and their facilities and where, how, how much they are respected or not respected mm -hmm. by another authority out there. So there's, that's, that's one thing, and they, they've reversed many gains democratically by, by, by just not being able to appreciate and internalize what devolution was all about. Mm -hmm. So when you have a national government that refuses to move, to think that eight billion is something they can, they steal more than eight billion a month, let alone pay the doctors in a year. So the cost of corruption is even much higher. This is about 3,500 people. You see, if you look at the wisdom of that CBA, you have doctors running from one uh, law come to another, trying to make an extra 100,000 shillings. What you want to do is to lock that doctor into public service full time. And and, and, and pay is determined on the basis of workload vis-a-vis -vis productivity. Mm -hmm. The workload of the doctors in this country is, is not in doubt. You know, it's the only sector that can be evaluated almost on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a scientific basis. Even for the lawyers, if you, you, what does a legal department of a government do? You know, how soon, if you come in with a legal matter, it doesn't have to be attended immediately. You can give, tell the guy, come back two weeks later. The doctor has productivity. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is evident. It is, it is done. They work 15 to 18 hours a day. I know it because I have doctors, friends, and relatives who work in public hospitals. Mm -hmm. yeah, and they've decided that they will not work in private hospitals because they want to give a service. So lock them in there. You make that, if, you, if you're saying, and this is, this is said in uh, good faith, uh, and, I, and I see some people saying, oh, other public servants are being paid this much. The impression you give us, or the impression we all get, the smartest guys when we finished Form 4 were the guys who were taken to the, law, to, to the med school. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. There were a few super 160 at that time when we, 160 when there was only one medical faculty, and then mm -hmm. the second one then added it to 200. The, the, the top 200 students were taken to the medical faculties in the country. Uh, and then you, they go through a rigorous six year training. And I, the, the medical student is not even able to get a, a day out. We, we, when others are celebrating, mm -hmm. they do, is it 52 weeks out of the 54, is it 50 mm -hmm. weeks out of the 54? And then they do an internship. So you have said you are the best students. Then it only fa uh, follows that you, they have to have the best pay. 
It's, it's, it's just logic, work of logic. So you make, if you're going to take the brightest, then you have to also have the best in terms of, uh, of uh, service package. So for me, I think it's a, an entire philosophy of a country. When you start to underpay your doctors, you underpay your security establishments, mm -hmm. and you underpay your teachers, it means your philosophy of life or your philosophy of state is skewed. And then you take a politician like me and overpay. You take another uh, you know, bureaucrat somewhere and overpay. It means you actually are missing the point totally. So I think we need to rationalize pay, but we also need to motivate so that we, cre we create an industry uh, that, 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 that its productivity is seen. And, this, and when you pay people well, I want to believe, uh, then you can call them to account even mm -hmm. much more. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. When you don't pay people well, that's when everybody comes and puts their jacket on a seat and then go to do the next thing. Mm -hmm. so that and I'm glad that you mentioned back. that uh, politicians are overpaid and uh, you know that gives us the right to take them into account considering that they are paid by Kenyan's taxes. But uh, there's a lot going on in uh, the, the country with regard to drought, the drought situation and who to be held accountable, whether our leaders are failing, whether the government is failing. But I mean, Jackson, are Kenyans blaming the government too much? Is this, you know, because there's a lot to do with the climate as well. And uh, it's not just, Kenya isn't the only country facing drought as we speak? Uh, yeah. Uh, personally, I also think uh, that as a country, despite the issue of climate change and everything, we, we also need to be prepared. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is something that has been going on. And of course, we have people who know what's going to happen in the next few days or few months. It's something that uh, we, we, we must, you know, you know, as a country, what we normally do is that when something happens immediately, that is the time we want to, you know, uh, go there and now start blaming each other. Uh, you know, this should happen, this should not happen. But again, uh, we've just talked about uh, the, the, the issue of corruption and, you know, uh, there are so many things that are happening in the country and there is some part of Kenya. Uh, I looked at the television just the other day and I couldn't believe that that is the part of this country mm -hmm. where people are suffering and there is nothing, absolutely nothing, even water. So uh, as much as we want to blame the government for it, then we also need to do something about, mm -hmm. uh, about that issue because mm -hmm. it's something that we know and we must be prepared uh, each and every time. Uh, uh, it's unfortunate, but I also think that uh, the government also should do more and uh, uh, we, we don't want to see people dying because of drought. Right. Uh, I mean, William, just before you speak, when yes. President Uhuru Kenyatta mm -hmm. and his deputy William Ruto were giving their election promises, their campaign promises, the promise that every single Kenyan would have food and clean water to their disposal. Uh, it is just uh, almost the end of their term now, and there's drought, and there's no water, even in urban areas. How does this reflect uh, on the leadership? Uh, not very good, mm -hmm. uh, because most of the pledges uh, that, that, that are made during uh, electioneering, most of them are aimed at only getting someone into power. Mm -hmm. uh, the real task now comes once you're in government, uh, what do you do with the promises that you made? Substantially, we have witnessed the government try to renegotiate some of these uh, promises that it made. We've looked at the laptop issue. Mm -hmm. uh, that promise has been graded down substantially, and now we, we have iPads. Uh, but on the issue of drought and famine, I think there could be several factors. One, uh, of course, there are environmental issues. Over time, we say that uh, Kenyans for a very long time, due to the primitive uh, culture of accumulation of private wealth, uh, Kenyans have, have not been very good at conserving the environment, mm -hmm. uh, uh, saving water towers, water catchment areas. Most of these have been grabbed, which has affected the rain patterns and substantially has contributed to this issue of global warming. That has brought us to where we are, but also there are those agencies which are, which are tasked with uh, making sure that there's adequate food supplies. One of those is the National Cereals and Produce Board. It has not played its role very well. There has been a lot of issues of mismanagement, issues of corrupt practices in maize distribution. The other time uh, I just read in one of the dailies, even a simple matter as changing the kind of chemical that you use to tackle weevils in, in maize, the board of the National Seals and Produce Board has not been able to do that. As a result, up to about uh, six billion worth of maize seeds have been destroyed. Mm -hmm. Simple thing of just changing, making sure that uh, this kind of chemical, uh, the weevils have become resistant mm -hmm. to it, it has not been able to do that. And then also in terms of distribution and pricing, there are a lot of farmers who are hoarding maize in the anticipation that the prices are going to go high. 
as of last week, I was telling you right now, the price of maize meal of Ugali is more expensive than chapati. Mm -hmm. That is very worrying. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Senator Omar, early last year, Kenyans were dying of floods. Mm -hmm. Early this year, Kenyans are dying of drought. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there's just a lot there that doesn't add up. But all we're talking of is the problem. What is the solution to this? You know, there is no deliberate planning. Mm -hmm. Countries become what they are by planning. And then you have to add all these red types of corruption, etc. Food security. Every country that worth its 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 soul must have an element of providing for food security. Mm -hmm. On one side, the CS uh, agriculture is telling you they have food reserves, but then on the other side, can you, uh, starving to death. So I think these are some of the, the things that are the concerns of a country. And this is poor planning. There's no such. There's nothing else. You know. This country, God has blessed it abundantly. It's not, it's not faced by very harsh calamities. We, we don't have tsunamis and, uh, you know, tornadoes and, uh, you know, and all those harsh weather things that come with, you know, almost the wrath of God. But we, we are fa fairly moderated. We have enough time to plan between one, 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 one unfortunate flood or La Nina, El Nina, to, to the next, uh, to the next, uh, to the next uh, theater of, uh, of crisis. Mm -hmm. So the, the lack of planning, the lack of uh, being strategic in how, how, how we, we plan for the times of calamities is something that, that dev be devil So when you look, the solution is a, a, a competence. Somebody's failing somewhere. And nobody in this country takes responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's the worst bit about it. He has just been talking about people taking responsibility in Uganda when, because of the failures of the yeah. Uganda People's Defense Forces, U UPDF. So when, but when you do anything here, people have compromised the security of this country. You know, there are corruption in security. Mm -hmm security apparatus is an act of treason. That's why I'm hoping one day I will be in a position to charge the Kenyans who brought the, those uh, generals and the, their procurement uh, uh, structure, to charge them for those 15 scrap metal jet fighters they brought from Jordan. You compromise the security of a country. You, when you see those, those F5, F5, F5s, about four of them, which is only now which are serviceable, mm -hmm. they're just making noise during during uh, Jamhuri Day, Jamhuri Day. Yes. Uh, they, they, they are not they are not ready for combat. Mm -hmm. those, those 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 things can be brought down by a simple you know Shadoof. Uh, uh, I mean, those are 1970 aircrafts. It's like driving uh, a beetle, you know, uh, in air. So just because there are others who others don't have those type of beetles doesn't make it a, a modern car. So that type of situation. And then we had the opportunity to upgrade our military. Upgrading military means you're securing the integrity of your country and your citizens. Mm -hmm. And you bring us scrap metal from Jordan. Right. That person must be in jail, whoever that person is. That mm -hmm. person must be charged with treason, high treason against the, the state. So when you find people sacrificing the security of this country, you know the well-being of this country, you know citizens are dying because somebody is not taking responsibility. We need to start to punish this uh, for, as criminal events mm -hmm. and criminal episodes. So unless we we start taking firm action. Uh, but when everybody else is a, is a cabal of eaters and looters and a cartel of de to defraud your, 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 your county, to defraud your nation, and then just you know, show us that you're flagging off uh, toilets and you're flagging off uh, taps that you're commissioning to poor people. I saw, some, I saw a governor, unless that's a Photoshop, Alfred Mutua looking at some young boy showering because he's put, 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 is it, I hope that that picture is a lie, <laughs> you know? Uh, I mean, looking at boy, actually, now looking like you have delivered, ultimately. I, hope I saw another governor opening up a tap. Right. And then Uhuru Kenyatta came moment. and opened a footbridge. In fact, Uhuru Kenyatta needs to punish the guy who told him to come and open a footbridge <laughs> and remove that plaque that says that he opened a footbridge uh -huh. at, at, at Mombasa. Uh, these are the governors. Whoever told them to, to, to do those, they should, be, they should be out of their governments by now. Mm -hmm. These are the, we have lowered our standards so low. I mean, people are commissioning everything in DSTV, in schools. Toilets. <laughs> and stuff like that, you know? All of and, it has been launched and commissioned. And then, and then, and then you see people in, in photographs giving uh, aspirants, giving some shillings here, doing this there. You know, we have made our, we've created, we have literally been very unfair to the poor in this country. Mm -hmm. We've humiliated them based right. on the fact that they, they, are, they, are, they are suffering mm -hmm. or they have the And I'm glad you bring in uh, the uh, aspect of humiliation mm -hmm. because uh, Jack Tun, you're an aspirant, MP aspirant, uh, Raysambo County on the Jubilee ticket. And I don't know how you're going about, uh, you know, asking your supporters to register as voters, but there's a lot of uh, nerve in uh, political leaders who make promises to Kenyans that I promise to give you food and water. And five years later, you got the 
very same Kenyans who are dying of hunger and dehydration and ask them to register as voters to vote for you again. You know what is happening right now mm -hmm. in the country, even in Rizambu constituency, people are not willing to go and get the voters card. Mm -hmm. When, 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 when we go to Mashinani there and talk to them and even ask them, some are even saying, we are tired, we don't want to vote again. You know, we are tired of false promises. We are even worse than before. And uh, I, I think this is not happening, not only in Roisambu, but most part of the country. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will tell you for free that when, when you walk around Roisambu and you know, the, the IBC centers, you'll find two, three people, two, three, four, we, we might say that Kenyans, they like last minute things, but I, I, I can tell you, even the IBC themselves, the, 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 the kind of target that they wanted, the 2.8 million, mm -hmm. they, couldn't, they couldn't manage in, the, in, in those two weeks. But also, I, I think that it's high time for our leaders, uh, 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 and that's why uh, I'm saying I'm, I'm ready as a young person to change that mentality mm -hmm. yeah, of giving false promises. It's, it's about delivering, and this is not your money you're using. Mm -hmm. This is a taxpayer's money. And once you've given a, a, your constituents a promise, then you must deliver it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter how, how, how hard you work for it, because, uh, again, we, we are all, all politicians are, you know, most people saying, you guys are the same. At times you go and, you know, you, 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 you want to sell your agendas, but uh, people are resistant. They don't even want to come to, to your meetings because they know that, it's just like the other person. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but what we are saying is that uh, I, I personally say that it's high time that uh, we go there, we make promises. If you can make your promise uh, 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 and you're representing a ward or a constituency or a country or even a, a county for that matter, you must deliver that. And these are big promises, not like opening the, you know, the taps and waters. And there are more pressing issues that are, are, are facing our, our, our people down there. Mm -hmm. And this is something that most of us, we, we like going hiding. We give handouts. You know, we go give handouts. And at the end of the day, if you give that, uh, 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 that person 200 shillings, 150, what, what, will, he, what will he hit tomorrow? Mm -hmm. you know? so, so what they are telling me, and, 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 and I think this is something that uh, I, I found out that uh, we don't want anything from you. We just want to hear what you have uh, on the table because we've been failed by the previous, uh, you know, uh, members of parliament. We elect them, they come with goodies, and at the end of the day, they disappear. Mm -hmm. This is the time they are coming back again to ask for votes. So we just, we don't need your money, Jackton. We only need to see what are your plans and if this one will change the livelihood mm -hmm. of, of our constituency. Mm -hmm. So you're not engaging in the handouts? No, 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 uh, no, no, because at, 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 be no, at, at the end of the day, it's, it's not about handouts. Uh -huh. But let me tell you, uh, as much as uh, money is involved, because now when you have to make inroads here and there, it's, it's a key thing. But as, as a young man who's been brought up in Roy Sambo mm -hmm. and uh, understand, uh, understand the problem of Roy Sambo, know each and every corner of Roisambo. I personally think that I, I need to do more than just giving the handout. Mm -hmm. if, if, if I have to upgrade a project that was started by these young boys, I'll do it. If, if they want a washing machine for you know, a car wash, something like that, you can contribute something because they'll tell you, this is where we are, this is what we are lacking. Bring them that machine and you'll find out that when you go there, you'll find them working, and mm -hmm. they're not idle. Mm -hmm. But if you meet them and give them 50 shillings, 100 shillings, tomorrow you'll come, they'll demand that for you, from you. If you don't give them the next time, they'll chase you away. Mm -hmm. So that is what most uh, uh, politicians are doing. But this is something that now we want to change. That, you know, guys, you're here. This is what I have on the table. We have women groups, so many in Roisambo constituency. They have... You know, they call them round table banking, mm -hmm. you know, and these small chamas and, you know, there's a way they organize themselves. Right. If you boost them as women, then you boost the society. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think the issue of handouts now doesn't work at all. All right. I mean, yeah. and uh, we know. Yeah. All right, let's hear from still, you, is, is, is still wrong. Now, how many washing machines will you continue giving? You know, these things of telling you to you and bring your washing machine or a car wash or whatever it's called, it's not, it's not good politics it's equally. Politics must be about policy. Mm -hmm. You're sure that you have a certain propensity towards a certain policy, and people evaluate you on the basis of your integrity, your experience, and your, and your past. That's what happens in the United States of America. That's mm -hmm. what happens in developed democracies. What happens is, this is Michelle Ngele. 
We want to take her as an anchor of one of the Kenya's leading uh, uh, media house, KDN. She has demonstrated that she won the presenter. Uh, she did one or two other things. She has worked. She has gradually grown through the ranks. She, uh, she then can manage being an anchor with a very uh, leading media house. So there's, and there, that's how political CVs are also drawn. Mm -hmm. What has this guy done to influence and impact the society in one way or another? Right. If you want to start distributing material wealth, whatever it is, go and join Oxfam. You know, go and join humanitarian organizations. <laughs> that's, what, that's where the, the, these humanitarian things are done. Uh -huh. So, but what you need to do is to, uh, is, to, is, to, is to demonstrate that you're going to do something in the National Assembly that will impact so fundamentally in policy. You will bring infrastructure by making sure that there's infrastructure development through, through your own participation in budgeting. You will make sure that through, the, through funds that are provided, certain areas of, uh, of, of prioritization will be your mainstay of government, of your, of your leadership. You must demonstrate that you have a certain, you will keep away from corruption, you start, you start going looking for tenders all over. Mm -hmm. And be, before you serve them, you're doing, ten, you, you become a tenderpreneur. So all these type of things, that how you build a regime, and when you come, when you want executive power, you must say, show, say that I'm a probably I'm a social democrat. I will uh, employ strategies that, that bridge the gap of dignity or indignity for that matter. I will, do, I, will do, I will have policies around social justice to ensure that we subsidize this. We will bring down the cost of food. We will bring down the cost of living. We will remove taxes from all essential products mm -hmm. that, that makes lives of Kenyans much, much more expensive. So, and you need to demonstrate that in a, in a, in a, in a either collegiate or individual format mm -hmm. as to what are the areas of interventions that you will seek out to do. I see all my people at CG doing uh, uh, tournaments. Uh, I never did these types of things, mm -hmm. you know. People knew me on the basis of my policy orientation at the Ken CHR. And the reason I come here every Monday is because these, con these conversations or dialogues are important for the country. Mm -hmm. To start disarming them from the narratives of the past, you bring them new, new ideas and try to influence the society uh, to progress in a certain direction that eventually we evaluate our politicians on the basis of merit, mm -hmm. and rather than how many washing machines and car washes and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and canvases they've contributed to us. All right. <laughs> All right, uh, gentlemen, and many thanks uh, for your contribution. Mombasa Senator Omar Hassan, Raisamba County MP aspirant uh, Jack Nobure, and High Court advocate uh, William Okech. On the way it is, a conversation that brings us a break here on Morning Express. We thank you for staying with us. Channel Life and Style is up next for the, the top stories at this hour and a sports chat with the Robin Toskin later on. Don't go too far.